Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next chapter in our series of aquaculture-related webinars designed to bring together science and business to expand and strengthen the United States aquaculture industry. These webinars are a joint effort between the National Aquaculture Association, the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, and the United States Aquaculture Society. Whether you're currently engaged in aquaculture, looking to get into business, or an educator helping others understand aquaculture, or if you just want to become a better educated consumer, we hope that these webinars will enhance your knowledge and move you forward on your journey to success. Today's webinar will be the first of a two-part series on biosecurity. Our presenter is Dr. Roy Yanong, who is a professor and extension veterinarian based at the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory in Ruskin. Roy's experience with fish health management and his extensive on-farm experience gives him a unique perspective on what it takes to plan and implement good biosecurity practices. And hopefully these practices will help us to minimize fish losses and curb the spread of disease on and off the farm. Roy, we appreciate you taking time to work with us today, and hopefully your presentation will inspire more farms to improve their biosecurity plans and in turn increase their profits. And for those of you in the audience today, don't forget to tune in again next week on July 27th for the second installment on biosecurity. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Roy. So today, what we're going to discuss is what you need to know about biosecurity. And there's definitely uh, quite a bit here. I'm hoping to kind of provide some good information in sort of a hopefully interesting format. Some of this you may kind of know or have a sort of an in intuitive feel for, but hopefully this will kind of put everything in perspective and explain why it is important for aquaculture, whether it's for your facility or maybe folks that you are working with. So a uh, quick note, U.S. aquaculture is, of course, really diverse, both with, with regard to species and systems. So this webinar is really just to cover general basic principles of biosecurity, um, some specifics, but it's not really intended to be comprehensive. As a colleague of mine, Dr. Kathleen Hartman with USDA does say about biosecurity, something is better than nothing. So hopefully some of these facts and, and uh, some of these suggestions you can use in your facility, if you have a production facility, and um, at least maybe try to think of all the big picture things we discuss. And hopefully at some point you'll be able to incorporate even more and more because the better you are with your biosecurity, really the better it should be with your production. If you have any questions or concerns that aren't covered in the webinar, please feel to contact me and my um, email is there on this slide as well as on the, um, it'll be on the uh, PDF that's provided for this talk. So let's start with a farm scenario. Let's say that you are a tilapia producer and you have a grow off facility with increasing losses over the past week in two of your systems. And I've got a little uh, kind of picture here with a couple dead tilapia. Those are upside down and dark in, uh, in the, those systems. So if this were your facility, how would you, number one, determine the cause of this outbreak? Number two, manage the outbreak. And then also, number three, prevent a recurrence. Do you kind of have a feel for how you would approach that? And are you set up to do that in a, a fairly systematic manner? Well, you are, of course. So you have the systems isolated. Your health team that you have in your facility work with your veterinarian who diagnoses a strep outbreak. You alert the rest of the staff. You begin use of an appropriate approved antibiotic. Your suppliers are contacted and you look at records and additional information to determine if this potentially was a source, a fish source issue or an in-house issue. And then you and your veterinarian discuss cleaning and disinfection protocols and potentially use of vaccines as well. So these are just some of the steps involved for a, a really good farm health management plan with a good biosecurity plan. Some of the things we'll discuss are um, really kind of pretty important for a general farm health management plan, but um, we'll have a lot of overlap with what is important for biosecurity as well. So these are all included together in this, in this talk. So let's talk about biosecurity in practice. It is really important, and we'll discuss each of these in a little bit more detail later, to have a really good health management team and to really consider this even before you have a problem, of course. You wanna be proactive. This should include, include someone who's gonna be the farm lead with any health and disease issues, a veterinarian and a fish health specialist, and a diagnostic lab that would be working with uh, you and the vet. Identify facility goals and operations. So what are some of the things that you and your 
managers and the facility are really trying to do with regard to production and, and other um, important parts of the pieces of the puzzle. You want to really consider targeting specific bugs. We'll talk a little bit more about pathogens or, or kind of disease organisms or bugs. Um, and it's really important for you to know what are of importance for your specific species. Just like with um, hazard, uh, with ha uh, HACCPs, if you're familiar with HACCPs, it's really important in biosecurity to identify facility critical control points or CCPs. These include anything that can go wrong in, in, in the process. So are you gonna be able to uh, know what to do if they, if they happen, if something goes wrong, how they can be prevented, how these things can be fixed, and also how you communicate and make everyone aware of these issues. Okay, so we've used the word and term biosecurity. What, what really is biosecurity in a kind of a big picture sense? So biosecurity uh, are practices that minimize the risk of introduction and spreading of infectious disease or disease-causing agents, which we call pathogens, either into a farm or facility, within a farm or facility, or leaving from a farm or facility. So really kind of important parts of the puzzle here. Good biosecurity is really, uh, you can consider it to be good added insurance against catastrophic disease events, which is usually when people kind of think about it, but it is really important for these potential low level or moderate chronic losses because good biosecurity will help kind of prevent those. And those are things that will kind of eat away slowly at your bottom line. So is it really worth it? There's obviously gonna be more work involved if you start looking and thinking about biosecurity for your facility, is it, is it really, really worth it? It's gonna require greater initial effort in both uh, in, in uh, multiple factors, time, money, and infrastructure. And of course, the really big one, which is employee buy-in, trying to get everybody on the facility to really kind of adhere and stick to what really needs to be done. Uh, as I mentioned, it is similar to insurance. So there is gonna be what kind of looks like a cost benefit, and some of that may not be really immediately apparent. My answer, of course, is yes. Yes, it definitely is. Um, you hopefully, you should, if you do things right, have healthier livestock, increase your production and income, reduce drug costs and labor to manage disease outbreaks, have essentially a value-added product. Once all this work has been done initially and uh, everything is set up, it should be easier to manage and you will have increased public and industry trust and, and really as kind of a, an industry or multiple industries of aquaculture in the U.S., really the, the, the better we can show how we, that we manage well, the better it, would, it is for everyone overall. Some people think, well, I really have good husbandry, you know, and why, so do I need to go kind of that extra step? And, and really good husbandry is, is really important, but it's not enough. Good husbandry, when we talk about it, will include, of course, good water quality, knowing how to manage your systems, what, whatever kind of systems you run, good stocking densities, nutrition, et cetera. Um, it is one component of disease prevention, and, and I kind of like to think of this as really kind of focusing on the animal, trying to make sure every, everything in the animal is, is as good as possible. Um, it will include things that will help reduce stressors and strengthen just kind of the internal and external defenses of your livestock, whatever you're raising. So you've got this little uh, kind of green pathogen here on the corner. He's trying to get through and he's good husbandry is pretty good, you know, will help in many cases, but you are going to have situations and pathogens that are going to be able to kind of get over that wall of good husbandry. And that's really what you're trying to prevent. You don't want to have any um, surprises. So biosecurity adds another major layer of protection as I've, I've uh, demonstrated here with additional bricks and really will focus more on control of entry and spread of pathogens, these infectious disease causing agents. So you got this little kind of green monster there trying to get in, you know, he'll make it up a certain way. And you know, if your biosecurity is really good, you know, it's gonna be really difficult for him to break through and get into your systems and, and your fish or, or other animals. So let's, let's hit a little bit on pathogens now. Many of you are kind of familiar with this, with this um, idea of animal and environment. Um, in the olden days, we could sort of split this out and we would have animal, environment, and pathogen, but really kind of a more, I think, modern approach and view of this is really to include pathogens or potential pathogens, I should say, potential disease organisms in or on the animal as well as in, or in, in the environment. So in, many, in some cases, we really can't get away from these because many of these organisms that can cause disease are part of the normal environment and maybe even part of the normal bacterial flora on, on your animals. So, you know, it is kind of good to keep that in mind that you're, you've got animal environment and these pathogens are just sort of 
kind of part of it or potential pathogens. Now, do you know your pathogens? Have you uh, been formally introduced, so to speak? So we've got this really um, scared fish here and he's um, gonna be introduced to potentially bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungi. And again, depending on what type of animal you raise, whether it's an invertebrate or a, a, you know, a, a fin fish or maybe even a, you know, a, an alligator or a turtle, there's a lot of different potential disease organisms that can cause problems. And it is important for you to know them. They're not all created equal, and there are gonna be different things that you need to consider. So number one, of course, which are these pathogens that your specific species can get? Are, they, are any of them regulated either by region, state, or by the feds? How easily and quickly can they cause disease? Where can they hide? And of course, we refer to these hiding spots or potential areas that they can kind of be found in, in more uh, discreet uh, ways uh, as reservoirs. How do you test for them? How do you control a disease outbreak? And how do you clean and disinfect appropriately against them or if you're trying to clean a, a system that they were in? So this is a slide with what the World Organization for Animal Health or the OIE has listed as diseases that are, um, are uh, of concern for international trade. And again, you know, countries vary in how they will approach this list. Um, you can see I've included fish, the fish, mollusk, crustacean, and amphibian list here. So some of these may or may not be relevant to what you're raising. Um, but you know, if, you're, if you are raising animals that are susceptible to some of these, these are, you know, these are things that you really should be aware of and things that your veterinarian, your uh, uh, aquatic animal health person should be um, aware of and, and, and you should speak with them about it. This is another list and this is from uh, the state of Wisconsin. And I spoke to the state vet there, a friend of mine, Dr. Myron Kivas. Uh, the state aquaculture vet, and and you know I, he kind of reminded me that we you know we have they have this list. Some of these diseases are going to be reportable in in which means that they have to be reported to the state, but not actionable. And you know that's similar for the diseases I showed in the previous slide with regard to in the U.S. Um, actionable means, of course, that you know the state or the feds will come over and actually do something specific. Um, so in, some diseases are going to be reportable. They need to know about it. They're not necessarily going to tell you what to do, it's, it'll be between you and your, uh, your health people, uh, but others are gonna actually have a requirement for specific action, and so it's good to kind of know the difference. Um, this is an example of pathogens and diseases of concern in Florida, and some of these are gonna be diseases or pathogens that are reportable and or some may require testing prior to import, so there's kind of a whole sort of different list of how things will, will go depending on the type of organism that's raised. So again, my, my point with these three different lists is, is you really keep, need to know where you're raising animals, what the requirements are with regard to reporting, and also what diseases are of concern for, for the at least regulatory side. You need to know obviously which ones can cause disease for your own uh, facility in, in order to help protect your animals, but this is on the regulatory or uh, reporting side, I should say. So let's go into the nitty gritty of biosecurity now. Uh, I like to kind of consider three basic M's of biosecurity. So you have animal management. Again, I'm just using tilapia here as an example, but could be whatever animal that you are raising. Uh, pathogen management, because so many different species, so many different types of pathogens, I'm using these uh, little cartoons to, to sort of denote different pathogens. And then people management. And again, um, people, can, people management can be almost the most complicated and difficult, and, but, but once it's, um, once the folks on your facility really understand what you're trying to do. I think it makes things a lot easier, but it is a really important part of biosecurity. You really need to make sure that the people are engaged, whether it's your staff or visitors. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these now. Uh, and of course, these are all interrelated. So let's start with animal management. So animal management practices are those that include looking at your source animals coming onto the facility. So incoming healthy eggs or other life stages like fry, juveniles, broodstock, or, or whatever um, types of early stages you, you may be dealing with with your uh, species. You wanna know your source. If there are specific pathogens or diseases of concern, are they testing for them or are you testing for them before they come in? Are you or are they doing any type of health evaluations at their site or on, are you doing any on your site pre and post um, arrival? And then of course, in, included in that, as I mentioned, sort of a kind of the overall health management, not necessarily strictly biosecurity, but just general farm health, is having good husbandry, which is important. So anything that'll reduce stressors, enhance immune systems or other defenses, and then 
potentially considering quarantine, which is really important. We'll talk more about that in a little greater detail um, and, and the different parts of that. All right, we're gonna skip over to people management. Um, right now, people management, as I mentioned, is really, really important. And this includes practices that will help educate your staff as well as visitors onto your facility. Having really good written protocols that everyone on the, on the facility understands as well as staff, um, and I mean, as well as visitors coming in and also having, as I mentioned, buy-in uh, is really important. You definitely wanna have accountability for any of these um, SOPs or protocols good signage, both for staff as well as for visitors, visitor logs, disinfection stations, disinfection stations for people and equipment, so things like foot baths, hand washing, net or other equipment disinfection. And then again, depending on your facility and, and concerns, things like vehicle disinfection, if, if um, you have visitors or your folks coming in from one farm or, you know, or another and, and then getting onto your facility. All right, now we're gonna talk about path pathogen management and there are, there's a lot to pathogens, so we're gonna spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, pathogen management includes practices that, number one, as we discussed, prevent introduction of specific disease-causing agents onto a facility or unit. Um, this is considered pathogen exclusion. Um, it is really important, and I kind of put this in parentheses, that you remember not all pathogen, or not all pathogens or potential disease agents can be excluded um, from your facility because some of them are going to be inherently in the environment and really more of an issue when the husbandry is bad. And then of course we also want to prevent spread and proliferation of some of these pathogens onto the facility or from leaving your facility and this is considered biocontainment. Um, not all diseases again or disease agents again can be biocontained because of the um, nature of the organism whether they may be normal flora on your animals or in the environment so you know keep that in mind know your pathogens. All right, now, uh, now we're gonna talk about snubbing pathogens or, or how we can exclude these pathogens. And so as we discussed, in some of the methods to keep some of these bad bugs out um, include looking at critical control points, points where you wanna make sure that your protocols and procedures are gonna be um, able to, to kind of do this exclusion. And so you're gonna be looking at Animal, your uh, animal sources we discussed a little bit, you're looking at water, looking at feed and food, looking at the environment and equipment and other organisms on the facility or that may be coming out of the facility and other animals as well, and of course people. So these are all kind of the, the points or, or uh, critical control points that need to be kind of examined. Um, these are also, and we'll discuss them again, sort of maybe a little more uh, uh, quickly, uh, important for trying to biocontain or prevent things from spreading, but this is these are all critical for looking at trying to keep some of these organisms out if if you can. So this is kind of a, a little busy picture, but but we're gonna come back to it later. I, on the upper left, I've got on-farm pathogens. So remember, you're gonna have some of these organisms that may be bad or less bad um, on your facility. I've got kind of a little purple guy here, little blue red-lipped guy here. You know. He's maybe a little more bad. Um, and then we've got potentially new organisms coming in and they may have their own types of pathogens. Some may be less bad or bad as well. So those guys are kind of here waiting in the wings. Um, you've, got, you've got a consideration for your water source, your people, and then things coming in and off the, um, off the farm that are not your, uh, your uh, potential livestock. So let's again look at animal source. You've got to really do your best to purchase healthy animals, which includes buying from a good source and minimizing sources if you can. Um, is your source testing and keeping records for specific organisms of con or pathogens of concern? Do they work with a vet in a diagnostic lab? Do they have any reports, you know, that sort of thing? Um, both them and, and for you, if you're dealing with sources from multiple, um, multiple sources and or if you have multiple species on your facility, is there a way or can you keep them separate? Um, sometimes, some organisms may be more susceptible to other or uh, pathogens than, than other, you know, maybe closely related organisms. So those things can um, be something to consider. Uh, are you using a protected water source? And, or are, are they using a protected water source? And also are, um, do they have a biosecurity program as well? So for your water source now, when we talk about pathogen exclusion, pathogen, uh, pathogen free water supply is really, um, Ideal, of course. Uh, you want to use what we call, we'll call, uh, we'll call protected water sources. These are going to be water sources that don't have pathogens 
that will cause problems, specific problems with your, your organisms, your, um, your animals that you're raising. City water, of course, um, a lot of times typically will have chlorine or chloramines to disinfect, and so you wanna dechlorinate if you use them. Those should be fairly protected. Um, well water, if it's fairly deep, typically is considered a good uh, clean water source and may require treatment or degassing. Um, if you are using groundwater or if you're maybe on the coast or using open ocean water for your systems, um, they may not necessarily be pathogen ex um, excluded. So you may have potential pathogens that can get on your um, facility or your animals. And so one way to try to make them clean or to do your best to clean them up is to use some sort of treatment, uh, typically mechanical filtration or settlement. Um, some people will use U uh, UV sterilization depending on the pathogens that they're trying to control ozonation and bleaching and neutralization. Um, of course, if you're using any of these, you really do want to have some sort of periodic quality assurance, quality control, QA, QC um, way to monitor your disinfection and make sure that it is, it is keeping up with your, um, your inflow of water. The real ultimate goal is to use only a protected source uh, or a, a pathogen-free, again, specific for the organisms that may affect your, your animals. You also want to consider your feed and food. Now there are some species of animals that really will only eat live or frozen foods, and uh, you know, of course, that you know that is fine. But you really need to consider, for example, with frozen foods, if you're feeding frozen fish or other um, organisms, um, what can survive freezing? So we know some bacteria can survive freezing. For example, strep. Um, some, of course, some viruses can survive freezing, depending on um, what. The organisms are and, and the type of you know the way things are frozen so so frozen is not necessarily 100 percent clean um, live foods of course can even be more risky if they're um, either potentially carriers of organisms that may infect your animals or they may even have uh, indirect light um, part of an indirect life cycle um, so live organisms are potentially able to carry all of them bacteria parasites viruses or fungi whether it's direct or um, indirect through a uh, life stage. You of course wanna avoid low quality or bad feeds if you're using uh, commercial diets and um, because those may have potentially uh, other organisms or even toxins that may be a problem. Um, and you really uh, of course wanna use fresh or fresh feeds or foods and, and if you need to, you may have to test your live foods periodically if you potentially have issues or if you wanna just make sure that they're not carrying something that may be a problem for your specific organisms. With regard to feeds and, and as well as the live and frozen foods, you really want to make sure you're using proper um, storage. Uh, the environment now, well, depending on your systems, again, I'm just I'm showing kind of a research system here, but it could be um, another type of system, and we'll talk about some of those briefly. But pathogens can easily find a home in these hard to reach and out in the open places. So got a filter here, you know, there's potential for pathogens to be in the pipe work. Um, this is a, a small sump here in the second picture on the left. Um, you've got maybe some, there were some sick animals, they were on the floor, the floor didn't get bleached down, and you've got a net here in the third picture, could be picking up pathogens that way. Just got a picture of a net dip um, in the fourth. So there's a lot of different places that you may not necessarily consider, or maybe you just don't want to deal with because, you know, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, but, but these are things you really need to consider um, when you are looking kind of at the big picture. Um, when we talk about cleaning and disinfecting, um, and this is typically for equipment or tanks or, or maybe even whole systems, um, part of that should include on, on uh, just a basic level, removing dead animals several times a day or, or ideally immediately. Those are gonna be nidises for uh, pathogens and potentially obviously bad water quality as well. Um, and Animals like to eat each other, you know, just the way it is. When uh, if something dies, many many organisms kind of like to kind of chomp on those. And if they're dying because of a disease organism, obviously that's not a very good thing. Um, when we look at tanks and other um, holding holding type uh, systems, you want to try to keep organic debris and uneaten food out as much as possible and clean those systems up because those can also harbor pathogens. Um, as part of cleaning and disinfection, you really want to make sure you're removing, you know, if you're cleaning a system or a tank, you wanna make sure you remove all the um, organics and all the, the dirt and, and other things that may be um, on the biofilms as well, clinging to the walls. Um, because if you try to just disinfect without doing that, you're not gonna be as effective. If you are, when you disinfect, you wanna use an appropriate disinfectant. And those are gonna vary which ones you use depending on uh, your, 
your situation and, and your concentration, your site, and, and also the pathogens that you're trying to uh, kill. So, you know, we've got maybe some references at the end of this talk that you can look at and, and or discuss with um, your health people. You want to soak equipment and disinfectants for the appropriate time and allow them to air dry if you need to, rinse them if necessary before. And you really do want to have SOPs for that as well. And ideally, when you are getting new animals in, if you can, you want to clean and disinfect those holding facility, uh, systems or holding tanks before you put new animals in there. Um, there are going to be limitations. Um, I was asked to do a, a, a Southern Regional Aquaculture Center um, biosecurity series. And one of the comments when I was first doing some of the um, initial write-ups was, well, what about ponds and, and you know, these other things that are difficult? Well, you're, you're going to have limitations. You know, pond culture is inherently going to be in the out, outdoors, in the dirt. You're not going to be able to do 100% disinfection, of course. Uh, but there are things that you can do to try to minimize or try to reduce your pathogen loads and, and type of pathogens there. You can, if you can, in, in areas that don't have high water tables like we do in Florida, you can consider um, sun drying or desiccation. The UV is really a good um, killer of many things. Um, if you can pump out water, you may want to try to consider liming the soils to a pH of 10 or 11. Um, again, may not work for you, but these are just things that you, you may want to consider. If you've got really large or bulky equipment, like really large seine nets, you could consider some sort of um, rinse to clean out all of the uh, organics and then look at it, either spraying or soaking them with a disinfectant and then rinsing them, letting them sun dry. Um, same with you know large net pens. They're going to be, uh, obviously many of these things are going to be much more bulky. Uh, so you've got to try to come up with ways to saturate them and then maybe, um, you know, again, rinse and sun dry. Same with tractors. You know, whatever you can do to try to disinfect the areas that are most likely going to be carrying pathogens. Um, bottom line, every farm and situation is unique. So you really do need to talk with your extension, local extension agents or if you have consultants that are working for you for really specific recommendations and, and get to get a better handle along with, of course, your veterinarian or fish, your uh, aquatic animal health people. Um, other animals. So unfortunately, um, especially again for folks that are on the, in the out, uh, doing production in the outdoors, there are going to be a lot of other animals that, you know, like, like fish, just like, you know, just like we do or like other, other whatever you're raising, you know, may want to try to get in there and, and get some or, or maybe just want to bother them. Um, some of these organisms in, um, can have pathogens in their digestive tracts or potentially in other organs. Um, they can also be external on the skin or um, gills or other parts of their body, depending on what the species or animal is. Um, if possible, you wanna use methods to exclude or deter in, in Florida and in, in, the, in the South, as well as in other areas. We've got issues with birds, otters, reptiles, which are um, reptiles and amphibians, so snakes, frogs. Uh, we have alligators, of course, here in Florida, raccoons, other animals. Um, you wanna try to keep them away like, uh, as much as possible using netting. If you can enclose a, a structure, that's great still going to have ways that they can get in, but at least you're minimizing that. And also, you may need to use visual or noise deterrence. Um, in some cases, unfortunately, for example, with birds, they're going to get used to it, and you've just got to figure out ways to, to change that. Um, there were some folks that were using trained dogs to try to um, chase and move uh, birds away from ponds, but really to do it, in some cases, the, bird, the dogs would have to get into the ponds um, so there are some issues with biosecurity that way as well. So it's kind of a, it's going to be a trade-off depending on how bad your facility is. On the right, I've got a picture of a wading bird here and some of our ornamental fish and some of the um, parasites here that can be carried by birds into our system. So we've got some roundworms here in this angelfish, some um, digenean trematodes on the tail of this swordtail that are coming um, from these other animals. We've got here in the lower picture some netting that is used and, and it's helpful to a, to a pretty good degree. If you're dealing with open ocean or lake or reservoir net pen culture, obviously much, much, much more challenging. Um, you are gonna have wild fishes as well as other, in, you know, as well as inverts. If you're in the ocean, you know, marine mammals are, are really an issue as well. Um, so there are gonna be a lot of, a lot of difficulties um, so these are some of the challenges, you know, in outdoor ponds, as I mentioned, we discussed a little bit, depending on the size of your ponds and what types of organisms you've got to deal with, um, as well as the ability to really try to even take water out and disinfect, you know, those, those are the challenges you're just going to have to try to, um, you know, work and, and, and do what you can really. Um, coastal and benthic culture, like with bivalves, you know, again, a lot of it's, a lot of that's probably going to come down to trying to get really healthy, um, healthy stocks to begin with. And, you know, if there are, 
any types of stocks that are more resistant because once you're you know placing them uh, on the floor of course or on you know, on their uh, their sites then you're a little bit pretty much uh, dependent on the environment and what what they're going to do and of course good siting for those are important as well, as well as with open ocean and FN cultures. Um, with open ocean and FN culture, siting, as, as many of you probably know, is really, really critical. Good water flow, all these other factors that people look at when they're siting, um, but it's also important, obviously, to have extra nets available. Um, worked with a producer that was having issues with a monogenean, um, a monogenean on, on their fish, and you know, they had to essentially start rotating nets and, and disinfecting them in between um, because it's really, obviously, difficult to keep other species from getting into and affecting some of the those fish. So animal control, uh, water source of course is gonna vary and, and um, may be difficult to control as well as disinfection. Um, there are other limitations. Bottom line, do what you can. You know, look at the animal, look at the foods you're using. I mean, you gotta basically try to work with what you have the abil uh, ability to work with when you look at biosecurity and there are gonna be um, challenges, but there are always gonna be innovative ways to try to reduce your, um, potential risks. All right, so let's talk about people a little bit now. So people can definitely carry things around with them. And you know, one of the most obvious many of you are probably aware of it is on, on their hands, is they're handling animals or, or the water. Um, so having a way for them, for your uh, staff and, and visitors to wash their hands, whether it's potentially using antibacterial soaps or alcohol-based hand cleaners, both entering and leaving the facility, as well as going from one uh, system to another if they're staff. Um, disinfect or change footwear before entering a facility. Um, one of the kind of bottom line things for this is if you are using um, you know, nets or other things, you don't want to place them on the ground if possible, unless you really have a good protocol for making sure your, your floors are always disinfected. Um, so that this will also help um, using uh, disinfection for footwear. And then of course, limiting access to areas that are gonna be more risky. So quarantine areas where you're still trying to feel out and um, observe and monitor animals and, and also having specific staff that work in those areas. Likewise with visitors, you wanna have restricted area um, access and also record entry. So if there's issues, at least maybe you can do some tracing. And with parking, again, this really depends on your facility, what, what uh, level of risk these folks may have and, and, and the type of organisms you're raising. Um, you know, whether you're going to look at cleaning and disinfecting wheels, wheel wells, um, undercarriage, et cetera. So again, a lot of these are really going to depend on your, um, your, your situation. One other thing about people, if you are working with folks that maybe have their own aquariums or their own ponds, at, you know, in their house or have other jobs, you know, obviously that's something you would want to discuss with them ahead of time, make sure that they're, um, you know, cleaning up or washing up or changing clothes before they come onto your property because you don't want them to bring things on from their other jobs or from their home as well. Bottom line, education, written protocols, buy-in and accountability. So now we've talked about exclusion. We're gonna talk a little bit about containment. A lot of these uh, are gonna be kind of similar because basically we're just trying to keep the pathogens from spreading. And so it's, it's in some cases, it's very similar to what we discussed earlier. So we'll kind of go through. So biocontainment procedures will include, of course, good husbandry and good standard operating procedures for biosecurity, just like we discussed with um, exclusion. And with both exclusion and contain biocontainment, you want to have very good and meaningful record keeping. Um, you want to really have good regular cleaning of your holding systems. We discussed removing uneaten feed and, um, feces, regular cleaning and disinfection. And really, uh, ideally, before you actually design a facility or build a facility, you really want to look at ease of cleaning. And so with some of the folks we work with, um, some of them will have pipe work that they can easily maybe open or valve open some of the larger um, pipe sections and they can actually blow those sections out. You know, a lot of times debris will collect in the pipe. So, you know, things like that, or even having things that are much easier access for your staff to get into and clean. If they're, if it's difficult, even if you have uh, SOPs, the staff are going to be much less happy and less likely to do it. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, wood, a lot of people use wood, but of course, um, you know, if you can limit its use, that's that's great. It's a lot of times going to be really cheap. So just got to keep in mind if it's you know wood and it's porous, it may actually collect things that you may not necessarily want. As we discussed, outdoor systems have their own challenges, in, including animal control. Um, as part of biocontainment. Again, want to have really good health monitoring of your livestock. So, as 
the health person and, and the um, husbandry staff will really want to be discussing and, and talking with each other, communicating, knowing whether the animals are eating or not eating, if any of them look strange, have external uh, changes in their appearance, those things need to be monitored um, really very closely. Um, first line of defense. Then if you do find any animals that look sick, you wanna call those, isolate them, and really start working with um, your veterinarian, health, health people, health specialists, who, who you're working with, the labs, figure out what's going on. And occasionally, depending again on your system and your, um, what your, your goals are, really having a routine health assessment of apparently healthy animals as well. If you're a shrimp producer, you're worried about specific um, viruses, you know, you may want to have periodic testing for those. Again, it really depends on kind of what you're raising and, and your concerns about risk. We discussed already removing mort mortalities as soon as possible and reiterating, you know, record keeping really is important and will also kind of help assure that things are being done if, if record keeping is being um, done diligently and, and honestly. Redundancy, well, this seems kind of um, obvious, but you know, a lot of people just don't wanna maybe spend the extra money and it is an in increased um, uh, effort with regard to, to income as well as uh, even with regard to logistics. Uh, but of course, we always say don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, additional practices, include trying to reduce aerosol transmission between tanks. There are pathogens that can be spread from tank to tank just in, in water droplets. Um, if you can have some sort of barriers, that'll be helpful. Um, and also minimizing transfer of animals between tanks and systems. So in the upper uh, part of this picture, we've got one uh, life support system, all the tanks are connected. One tank gets sick, it's gonna spread a lot more easily and you're you know potentially screwed, maybe, maybe not. Um, if you have, your uh, animals separated, then if one tank goes down, it's gonna be less likely, you know, again, especially if there's good biosecurity and you're not spreading water and tanks, and, and um, I'm sorry, water and, and equipment between the tanks, um, there's gonna be less likely that you're gonna lose everything. And so again, redundancy, people, we talk about that, I'm sure many of you have discussed it, and it's just, um, it's just a good idea. Also, if one of your pumps goes down, or if you have an issue, then, you know, it's kind of the same deal. You hopefully will have a backup, but also you're gonna lose less if, if that's um, there. Of course, things will cost more, but keep that in mind. Um, so let's talk about transmission now of pathogens in, in two terms, vectors and fomites. So vectors are organisms that can transmit pathogens, and that includes things like parasites. Parasites can, it can spread other types of organisms from one animal to another. Um, things like birds and snails are often parts of life cycles that will spread parasites, for example, as well as other organisms too. Um, to animals, and then of course people will actually be able to spread things on their hands and arms as well. Uh, fomites are inanimate objects that can carry pathogens in just a, you know, a brief list, but there's a lot more things you could probably think about. Nets, buckets, siphon hoses, brushes, algae, algae scrapers, feeding implements, vehicles, you know, your sh you know, other, other equipment that you're using. All these things can spread pathogens uh, from one area to another. Just like you see here with this little blue guy. Hiding places, we talked about this with reservoirs, just to kind of uh, reiterate uh, livestock. You know, you can have healthy carriers, carry uh, animals that maybe overcame a disease and you know, you're getting them from a, your, your source. Maybe they were kind of sick a little bit, but got better and so you're getting them in now, but they're maybe carrying some organism that your, your fish on site have not seen before. Um, of course, disease or dead animals will potentially carry things as well. System water and filtration components, we talked about that already. Substrate, um, things in the uh, pockets in the cement or tanks or on the floor as we also discussed. And again, fomites, all these things can harbor pathogens. Visitors, again, I wanted to show this terrible um, monster visitor here, you know, who knows, might come onto your facility and, and carry some, you know, alien disease, but um, even, even normal people can potentially bring things on, so keep that in mind. Um, waterborne pathogen transmission, well, Depending again on the type of disease organisms you're trying to control, you know, some folks will use UV. This is a really heavy duty bank of uh, UV sterilizers, uh, uh, sterilizing units uh, that can be used to help try to kill pathogens in line, so in a, in, a, in a system. You can also potentially have problems with transport water if you're getting or, um, source, source animals in and if you're maybe just dumping the water in the system, of course, your source water may have more issues with it, even maybe in higher concentrations than your animals themselves. 
your transport water, I mean. System water, I, I discussed a little bit earlier, but things like UV sterilizers and um, ozone, um, UVs can be both inline and done as a side stream. Ozone obviously typically is done as a side stream and you wanna make sure that um, you're using these appropriately and, and, um, and safely. And if you are, again, trying to look at sources of water that are not necessarily gonna be protected, as we discussed earlier, you wanna to try to consider some sort of disinfection. So for airborne pathogen transmission, we touched on this briefly. There was a real good study done um, a while back where water droplets and potentially ventilation systems kind of can help waft some of these droplets from one system to another, can actually cause ick, which is a fairly large um, one cell parasite, to go from one system to another, can travel a couple of feet. So again, you're, you know, logistically, you may not be able to cover everything and, and you know, a lot of the things that are ideal to do may not be really logistically feasible, but at least be aware of these things. And that way, if you have an issue, maybe there's some things you can try to do to try to minimize your, um, the losses. Uh, likewise, service agitation, all these things that can kind of spread water or droplets from one system to another will cause problems. Um, close proximity, of course, makes it easier. Okay, quarantine. So uh, a lot of folks know what quarantine kind of means and, and um, may or may not try to do it. And, and it really, I know, kind of depends on your facility and your animals and your, your, your goals. But um, what should you quarantine? Well, animals coming from outside the facility is probably a really good idea. Um, any animals that have come from outside the facility but, uh, or, or you may be inside the facility in contact with other animals or other systems, I'm sorry, that you're moving maybe to new systems, maybe something you want to keep an eye on. Um, livestock that have been exposed to water from other systems also coming from outside the facility. And, and bottom line is um, if there's a potential that an organism or an animal that you're raising has been in contact with, with water or other animals that are um, not associated with your facility, that may be a reason to quarantine. And we've got this tilapia jetting with a, a green monster into, uh, I, that's actually our lab there. So why quarantine? You want to, again, prevent disease introduction to populations that are on your facility coming from new animals, as well as from the existing population on your facility to the new animals. So it really works kind of both ways. You're trying to prevent disease from going both ways. It's not just, in, it's not just a one directional thing. And the quarantine will also help for these new animals to get adjusted to new, potentially new feeds, water parameters, and husbandry protocols. Also, if you can quarantine them, rather than um, kind of putting them in maybe into a, a new facility, I mean a new large system, um, you may make it, it may be easier than to monitor, capture them, treat them, or um, even heat or cool them if, if you have that ability. Uh, most importantly, quarantine uh, animals typically are coming, or, or uh, new animals coming out of your facility typically have just been through handling and shipping and other um, potential stressors. And so they're going to be either immunocompromised or maybe have other problems that will cause them to be more susceptible to disease. And so this quarantine period also allows them to have a little bit more time to kind of get a little bit healthier before you put them in with your, you know, already healthy, but potentially carrying um, other diseases, your, your uh, resident animals. It's not always logistically feasible as we discussed, but really, as I mentioned, a lot of this talk is kind of letting you be aware of, of things you need to think about. And if you can incorporate some of these, that, that, would be, that would be good. New stocks coming in from a place you haven't gotten animals from before, always something you want to consider. Um, so what about acclimation, quarantine versus acclimation? Well, quarantine involves isolation, usually at least three weeks, maybe four, five, you know, five weeks, maybe even more. Um, depending on if animals break down with disease or what the um, concerns are. Isolated systems and equipment, you want to separate species. And also, if you have the same species from different sources, you want to separate those. You reduce densities if you can. And then you do want to have um, some sort of diagnostics and treatment, if, if possible, to see if there maybe are carriers or other issues. This is going to cost more and, and also have require more labor, but it is really kind of the ideal thing to do if you are it's concerned about things coming out of your facility. Acclimation is typically just kind of getting a real quick, um, getting the animals really quickly assimilated into your system. So it can be done in a couple hours. There, it may be done easily kind of in a group sort of setting. It does reduce stresses potentially a little bit if you do, you know, do it over a couple hours. Um, and you may be able to 
potentially do treatments like bath treatments for some animals, but it's not really optimal, obviously, because it's pretty quick. The animals not necessarily have gotten kind of their uh, bearing and, and they're also maybe carrying pathogens. Um, so, you know, just some suggestions. If you've got the ability to, you know, and you're getting animals in and you really are pretty concerned or, or at least want to be a little more aware, you can have pretty closed, um, isolated buildings or other areas that are fairly walled off that you can bring new animals on and have quarantine systems. Uh, once they pass, then they can kind of go into your general population. If you have a pond system, you might be able to maybe isolate a pond that's kind of out in the corner, put some uh, put animals that you just get in on, on in those ponds, and then not necessarily put them into the general population until at least you've observed them, and, and obviously have dedicated nets and equipment and, and people and that's and SOPs to avoid spreading any of those um, or, or uh, having breaches in that biosecurity. So, what are some elements of effective quarantine? Uh, dedicated tanks ponds and holding areas with signs and restricted access. Clean water sources, again, we talked about that, and clean systems. Uh, ideally, all in, all out stocking in, in some uh, types of industries that, you know, I know this is a little bit more complicated, uh, but it, ideally, all in, all out is, is, is preferred, um, typically and ideally in an entire system. Um, and that will kind of help reduce issues with um, potentially age-related diseases or older animals giving diseases to younger animals coming in, et cetera. Um, if you need to, maybe even tank by tank, but but ideally, all in all out, it's a good principle. Isolation and separation of, of units, very important, of course. Um, we discussed this already in, in various uh, iterations. And then really the observation is, is pretty critical and having very, very good staff that know what they're looking for, really pay attention to the detail, aren't just kind of throwing food in and you know and kind of leaving, but really observing, uh, looking at behaviors and looking at the animals as they as they hopefully come up and and feed or, or depending on your situation, being able to see if there's anything abnormal externally on them. So again, you know, three weeks, maybe 30 days if you can. Um, all these things we discussed already, clean water and systems, temperature, acclimation, feed management, minimize stressors, surveillance, we, we hit upon um, basically trying to look for disease, potential issues, and, and maybe even grabbing samples if you can to just do checks on healthy animals. Um, monitor them as we talked about daily for any distress or disease. Physical exam, visual and external if you can, if you're dealing with fish. Typically we look at skin, fin, and gill biopsies at least. And then screening for specific pathogens. Again, there's going to be a lot of different organisms that can cause problems and you really want to know what you're wor worrying about. And if you can, sacrifice some animals um, with your uh, health people to do more complete diagnostics. If there's a disease you want to really Jump on it. If you have a few uh, animals showing disease or losses, you, you know, obviously don't want to wait. You really want to make sure you're um, on top of it so that you prevent any further um, losses. And again, good sanitation or cleaning and disinfection to reduce the, the loading, really. You know, a lot of times we are really talking about loads and trying to minimize them. In many, in many cases, we can't necessarily eliminate certain things and you just want to reduce the amount that's there of, of organism, disease organisms. So ideal quarantine, a quarantine system should be separated and isolated and independent. Simple, simple filtration away from other systems. We talked about UV, UV and ozone potentially to help reduce numbers of pathogens. Um, if you can have the ability to bypass the biofilter, if it's a recirculating system to try to treat a, a unit, a holding unit if you need to. Dedicated equipment, dedica dedicated equipment and also potentially the ability to darken or lighten the tank if you need to um, for uh, monitoring. Um, should be fairly simple, easy to clean, and appropriate for the, the animals that you're raising. Um, finally, I wanted to discuss biosecurity and the, um, the NAA and USDA's Commercial Aquaculture Health Program Standards. Some of you are probably familiar with this. Um, it's kind of in development, and, and um, at least in terms of um, having more folks aware and maybe starting to participate. I know they've, they've been doing some um, testing and, and getting more feedback. Uh, but really, the stuff we talked about really fits in well. The, the five components specifically of the CAPS program include having, number one, an aquatic animal health team, which is looking out for disease and managing health. Uh, part of these, uh, the next component of the CAPS is having risk characterization and management, which is really site-specific. So again, depending on your facility, looking at a risk assessment and evaluation, and then really having a written plan for farm-specific diseases, which would essentially be your biosecurity plan. 
Number three, having a good surveillance program with strategy and plan for specific pathogen testing. Number four of the uh, principles for or components for CAPS is investigation and reporting. So when to investigate a health problem, um, you know, when to start getting all your other folks together outside the facility. Hopefully they're always communicating anyway. And also when you need to report, and we discussed a little bit about reporting and, and other uh, things earlier, and if necessary, and to whom. And then finally, of course, number five is response. How do you address these health issues? Um, and how can you recover and return to business as usual? And, and if you have all these things in place, a good plan, et cetera, it will be a lot easier to get back to business as usual. Um, so as part of CAPS, there is what's called a site-specific health plan. It has a lot of different components to it, um, and, but it does include a biosecurity bio plan and a surveillance plan. So I just wanted to kind of, again, um, introduce you, some of you who may not have heard of this or may not know it um, as clearly as, as um, others, and I've got some links there as well to get to more information on these. So in summary, biosecurity is really important, of course, for good farm management. You want to develop a health team. Hopefully you have one already in place, but if not, really start thinking about it. Have a really good um, health surveillance and biosecurity plan that's written, um, hopefully with, um, and also hopefully with employee buy-in. Uh, employee buy-in, as, as many of you, of course, know, is really critical. And you can have the best plans in the world, but if the employees are not um, part of it and don't feel like they're part of it and, and don't understand and don't buy in, it's, it's not going to be successful. You really do want to know your pathogens. Um, they do vary in their badness. Um, some of these pathogens or disease organisms are all over the place and, again, on healthy animals in, you know, in the water normally, so it's really a matter of control of numbers and husbandry. Others are going to be more of a problem and, and considered more, more um, of concern, and those are the ones that you may actually want to be testing for and or um, you know, have a little more information on as well and how to control those a little better um, because they can be devastating depending on your, your uh, industry and your organisms as well as um, your uh, situation. So you know, know your pathogens. Quarantine and isolation of sick and quarantine of new animals and isolation and, and uh, essentially quarantine of sick animals on your facility does really save lives. Uh, as we talked about, new animals can give the resident animals new diseases, but the resident animals can also give their diseases, even if they're healthy, to the newbies. So you want to keep that in mind when you um, get new animals onto your facility. Also, never want to forget good husbandry. As we talked about, that is basically foundational to uh, good farm management, but it's unfortunately not the only thing that you, you need to worry about. You know, biosecurity is an important part of that. And of course, good communication. Um, important regardless of which um, who you're talking about, whether it's your staff, your visitors, the folks that are working with you outside, consultants, agents, veterinarians, other health people, et cetera, that are um, going to be working with you. You want to have really good communication so that um, if there's a problem, you're not behind the eight ball. So a quick pictorial summary of the talk. You got We talked about our little farm pathogens, bad and less bad, and, and they're going to be on your animals or in, in the water, in the environment. You want to have good cleaning and disinfection a good clean water source and hopefully you've got a way to clean up your water source or uh, if you need to, if it's not a considered a protected water source, good uh, employee as well as uh, just good um, disinfection and, and uh, other protocols to try to prevent spread of some of these diseases. Um, also looking at your source livestock and, and really trying to keep an eye on them quarantine if you can because they may have bad or less bad pathogens that you don't want to introduce if you, you can help it. You've got animals and other things coming on the property that you really want to kind of keep an eye on as well, and, and we talked about some different ways to do that. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Kathleen Hartman, Dr. Catherine Starzel, and Dr. Marion Howville for uh, their insights and suggestions for the discussion um, and, and this talk. And um, a number of references. There are uh, other references besides mine, but these are the ones that um, uh, I've used a lot for, for this talk, and, and these are Southern USDA Southern Regional Aquaculture Center publications, as well as um, University of Florida Extension Pubs. Uh, but there are going to be other references as well, I, and, um, but I suggest maybe starting with these. If you've got any um, questions or other things you'd like to discuss, feel free to contact me, and uh, we can kind of go from there. If, if I don't know, I can find some of my expert colleagues to help. And again, thanks to USAS, NCREC, NAA, and, and uh, USDA for 
um, providing funding for this. And if you have additional questions, we've got a contact there as well. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully um, you got something out of this and at least um, maybe have, have some things to consider for your facility and ways to maybe improve and start to maybe increasing, increase your biosecurity plans if you don't have any in place right now.